Um, all right, so I'm gonna just quickly talk about um, using these genomic assays for drug sensitivity to guide therapeutic decisions. Um, and I say, is it a pipe dream? Because we do wanna get there. The question is, are we there, right? And um, quick disclaimers, I think is important to just put it in there is, uh, you know, obviously my uh, um, uh, funding from with pharma, but I'm not a researcher who works in this area. So this is uh, very much um, not my, main research focus. So just to take this with a bit of a caveat. But also I think uh, what we are talking here is genomic assays that predict chemosensitivity on, a, as you saw in that report just now, um, in the absence of any clinical trial data from Pricer. So we are not talking about like, you know, using EZFR targeted drugs or other things like that, right? So if you have a find an EZFR and then there is clinical trial data, we are not talking things like that. We're talking about these assays that say like, oh, you're going to respond to this or that in the absence of clinical trial data. Right? So a little bit of, I think everybody, when we think of these assays, we are always thinking of like, oh, from microbiology, from infectious disease, let's just do these things, right? Because infectious disease has been very successful in terms of identifying how we can predict uh, antibiotic resistance or sensitivity. And whenever somebody hears that, or as in our own experience, we think that, okay, we can just translate that into cancer and why can't we just look into the genomic areas or we'll do some of these cell cultures and then come up with a, what drugs are going what chemo drugs are going to work the the challenge is that you know unlike bacteria uh, where we can do all of that human human beings are very complex and complex and cancer cells are also more complex than bacteria so it's not one piece of information that we are looking for, right? So we have several things that we need to tackle. We have tumor heterogeneity. We have how we deliver drug to a particular uh, reason. We have issues with uh, the immune environment. We have to take care of that. We have to understand what mechanisms are involved in resistance, right? So uh, we were just now talking about TDXD mecha resistance mechanisms. You don't see a lot, whole lot of genomic changes to the, help us um, understand what are the mechanisms behind TDXT resistance. So human cells are cancer in general is so complex that just taking that approach in bacteria, even if you grew cells outside, you're not getting your entire microenvironment. You're not getting your whole issues with uh, drug delivery, all those things replicated in an in vitro environment. So I think that's that's the main thing. But there is also a whole host of non-genetic mechanisms to therapeutic resistance, right? And so when we are looking at these assays, which are primarily using genomic, uh, you know, and they're just using your tumor from FFP and coming back and saying like, based on their genomic analysis that this is gonna work, they're not accounting for all these non-genetic mechanisms that lead to therapeutic resistance. There is also this whole question of, um, there is a very nice uh, article in uh, Nature Reviews Cancer, if you want to go through it, um, and I, I'll, I'll share these slides so you'll have these links over there, um, talking about you know all these non-genetic. So the question also is our technology right now is not adequate to really truly and pick out uh, tumor heterogeneity, meaning you know when we think of what leads to therapeutic resistance, one of the co hypotheses right now is that all of these resistance clones are present right in the beginning. And so single cell technology allows us to actually identify that there are many different clones that are present right at the beginning of when cancer is formed. And that just in response to therapeutic pressure, whether that's metabolic hypoxic or drug, that the, you are selecting clones, right? Whereas when we do bulk tumor sequencing, what happens is whatever is the most dominant clone is what comes in your report. And that's why it seems like, oh, when we look at this, oh, there is this mutation or that mutation, but it does not really account for heterogeneity. And so as time goes by, our sequencing report changes because you know there is selection and what is the majority of tumor population changes over time. So, so it is this question of like, when we our technology is not reliable enough to pick up heterogeneity up front, how can we rely on the technology to protect chemosensitivity or chemo resistance, right? And then it does not take into account of cellular plasticity, how cells turn from one lineage into another, how cells evade uh, anti-cancer immune surveillance. None of that is taken into account into the current technology that we is being utilized to predict these chemosensitivity uh, assays. So I, I think 
genomic alterations are important. These things are important as we think about, you know, what drugs to use, all those things. But it's a piece of the puzzle. And I think that's that's really the key when we think about all these chemosensitivity assays is it's really not taking into account into like a thousand other ways how chemo resistance or chemosensitivity um, develop, the chemo resistance develop. So if you are just looking at one piece, then you are obviously missing the piece of the puzzle and you can be thinking of that, oh, this drug is gonna work or that drug is gonna work, but it's not because you know you are not looking at the entire picture. And then when we look at these, what they are using is they are using genetic markers to sort of come up with the, what drugs are going to use. But we have never, we don't really know which are drivers, which are uh, passengers. And um, those who have read like the paper when they first came out with the Alexandro and the, you know, the degree of mutations that are present in cancer cells, right? Cancer cells are, there are hundreds to thousands per whole genome. There's like so many different alterations that are present in each cancer cell. And that's just normal because, you know, they have defective DNA repair mechanisms. They have a lot of things going on and you see a lot of these um, tumor mutations, but not all of those. And I would say 95% of those are not drivers. They are just there because, you know, they happen as there are defective uh, re uh, repair mechanisms happen. So obviously, you know, when we see a genetic alteration, how do we come up with this whole, um, how do we realize that is it a, truly a driver or not, right? And if you are basing your genomic assays uh, to predict chemosensitivity based on a bunch of passenger mutations or alterations, then how can you be certain that those are truly gonna be predictive, right? So that's another key uh, issues that we are dealing right now, even in coding areas and then there are like so many other alterations in non-coding areas as well. So I think, you know, all of this to say, essentially to get to this point of, you know, how we develop drugs, right? How we target, um, how we develop a drug target and how we come to market right now. And this is where I think uh, is the key uh, sort of thing is, you know, often we will use these genomic assays to come up with what our targets are, right? So the kind of report that you say, saw over there, you know, that's the kind of a screen we would do, whether that's based on CRISPR or other things, we'll come up with and say like, these are potential drugs that are gonna be effective in this situation based on your, all these genomic alterations. Then we take them and put them in um, cell lines, we, test those drugs in cell lines, we test those drugs in PDX models, we do all of those things. And then we conduct our human trials, right? We go from phase one, phase two, phase threes, and then finally a drug is approved. What these genomic assays are essentially telling us is you can skip all these step two, three, four, and take the report and directly put it in patients, right? Would you ever do that based on, you know, what we know about all these drugs? And then to prove the point, I'll say, you know, 95% of drugs fail going from their, even if they are effective in cell lines and PDX models, they fail going from their initial trial to going into, you know, to showing efficacy in phase three trials. So only 5% of drugs actually are successful. So we are being asked by these assays to ignore all of those information and say like, go from step one to step five directly, right? And skip all of those. And I think, I think that's really the problem. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, I think we wanna get there. We wanna use these assays. We want assays that are truly productive, but the bar cannot be lower for any biomarker. You know, as we set bars for drugs, we need bars for um, assays as well. And, you know, it's very simple. I mean, they can, if they feel like their assay is really good and it predicts really well, they can do clinical trials. And, you know, obviously, you know, you randomize patients to predictive genomic assay-based chemotherapy versus investigator choice of chemotherapy and demonstrate that they are superior. What I have not seen, there are many different trials going on, but what I have not seen is a trial like that from these companies that show that these will lead to meaningful improvement in clinical outcomes. And there isn't an impetus to run these trials either. And so that's, I think, is really the challenge that we are facing right now is it's disingenuous is that they are marketing it, but they are not doing these studies. They are not interested in doing these studies because they themselves know that these assays are not gonna work, right? 
Uh, and there are, and and it's not that this is novel that we are talking. This concept is novel about trials. I mean, there are genomic predictive markers, right? Oncotype DX. I mean, we demonstrated that with clinical trials. All those things in terms of who needs to get chemotherapy or not. There are several other biomarkers that we have used, right? Even when it comes to EGFR, ALK, all these targets. I mean, those have all gone through clinical trials, and where we have shown that if there is a target present and you use a drug, it shows efficacy, right? So that's kind of my two minutes spiel on this um, and I'll stop and see if there are any questions on this. I think it's fair to say that as clinicians, we should not be prescribing it. I think uh, because I think they will not do the trials because if the clinicians are writing it up, uh, <laughs> why will they do the trials? So yeah. uh, as clinicians, as oncologists, I feel that we should not be doing this, uh, these kind of studies because it's, it's actually misleading the patient. Oh, absolutely. But Bhavna, there is also this also, and I think Leonard could uh, comment on this as well, is I don't see those assets being reported out in the US, like, you know, the same companies that do this in India, for instance, I like when we order testing, I don't know if you have to request for something special, and maybe we are not. But we don't get these uh, reports saying like, oh, this drug is going to work, like, you know, the one that you show, I mean, we get all these like, uh, like the FDA approved therapies and non-therapies and trials, those kind of things. Uh, but we don't get these blanket like, oh, doxorubicin and gemcitabine is going to work. So we have seen in our MDTs over the last three years, I think we've seen reports from Germany. I don't know, Ben is here, he can talk. And uh, another country in Europe where we've discussed in our MDT where they give chemo sensitivities. And, and I think you were, it's RR, I'm forgetting the name of the company, but if I go down, because we have records, uh, it's not just in India, but in other places as well, that this is quite, uh, quite rampant. I'm afraid there are companies in the US <clears throat> doing similar things, it, sometimes with cell cultures, sometimes with molecular analysis, sometimes with xenograft models, um, usually all at very, uh, significant financial fee-for-service, uh, uh, financial toxicity to the patient. And um, I, I very much try to discourage people from uh, obtaining these assays because I tell them up front as a clinician, I will not act on them. I do not consider them actionable information. Yes. And I invite anyone, I've, I've said this at meetings, uh, who believes in this sort of thing to show me a circumstance where a drug that would not be part of our standard considerations anyway is brought to bear on the basis of this sort of analysis and shows meaningful clinical benefit. Yes. And yes. I, I've asked and nobody can seems to think of a case where they've seen that. Um, and, and so very consistent with what Sid has said, the, you know, it, 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 it's lovely if you've got a good strategy, but every now and then you should go check your results um, and it's, it's not happening. Yeah. Ben, any comment? Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, full disclosure, one of my closest friends is working um, a lot in the academic setting um, on uh, patient-derived organoids um, that have been around for quite some time. Yes. And um, as just mentioned, um, the drugs that we use in pancreatic cancer research work well um, in these organoids. Uh, um, but we will never be able, so you can go back and retrospectively look, you started GEM-based or you started 5-FU-based, and sometimes there is a correlation in uh, the Petri dish to what you've seen in the patient, but really um, doing this analysis, as, as Sid has shown, that you randomize patients based on uh, sensitivity seen um, in vitro, um, hasn't hasn't really worked um, in, with anything that I've seen. And I welcome um, the statement. So in our precision oncology um, program, we don't um, address these essays either. Um, we sometimes get them handed in um, and then we say uh, we, we won't have a look at them. And by that, in, in Germany, because we're pretty harmonized with the molecular tumor boards, not that many um, of these tests are run and then then distributed because no one else is actually um, acting on them then in the end. Yeah. So, and, uh, I think uh, it's important that people understand this is kind of a holy grail of oncology, right? Everybody would like to be able to have scientifically driven specific recommendations for specific patients. We want this to be true. We're just accepting the reality that thus far, 
we have been unsuccessful, likely for the complex reasons that Sid so nicely just outlined. Yeah. And um, it doesn't mean that this isn't a very active area of research in many places because this is aspirational. Everybody wants it. It's just we have to accept the disappointing reality that we don't have it yet. Yeah. yeah and, and Leonard, I think that's the key thing is like, you know, the research is welcome, right? Like, so if somebody wants to do a trial with this, great and you know we had an organoid uh, similar ben as you were mentioning we had an organoid protocol in breast cancer where we were trying to culture everybody and say like would that help us guide through? a lot of things we found in organoid did not translate into humans and we were doing it as part of a research protocol so things like that are definitely welcome but just pushing it to patient without actually doing the research is not appropriate and i think that's that's the um, point that we are all trying to make over and, here. And the point is the research is appropriate, but you have to look at the results. My first R01 was based on some very promising preliminary lab data that we would be able to anticipate who would benefit from 5-fluorouracil and who would not. Yeah. Um, if they had gone forward with success, obviously, you'd have heard much more about that. Um, it, it, yep. it, same it's same with our idea, our... But then we did the studies and it didn't pan out. Yeah, yeah. Same with our organized program, which had to be shut down because it did not predict uh, sensitivity in in vivo, right? So, yeah. Great, thank you. I think I'm going to stop the recording. So we're going to stop doing these tests and stop recommending these tests as well. Um, so.